the peace settlements, 1919 to 1923. The First World War was ended by dozens of treaties signed in the period 1919 to 23. Of these, the five chief documents were the five treaties of peace with the defeated powers named from uh, the sites in the neighborhood of Paris where they were signed. These were Versailles, 28th, 1919, Saint Germain with Austria, September 10th, 19, and then Neuilly, Neuilly with Bulgaria. November 27th, 19. Trianon with Hungary, June 4th, 1920. Uh, Severus, Severus, Turkey, August 20th, 1920. The last of these, the Treaty of Severus with Turkey, was never ratified and was replaced by a new treaty signed at Lausanne in 1923. Peace settlements made in this period were subjects of vigorous and detailed criticism in the two decades 19 to 39. This criticism was an ardent for the, from the victors as from the vanquished. Although this attack was largely aimed at the terms of the treaties, the real causes of that attack did not lie in these terms, which were neither unfair nor ruthless, and were far more lenient than any settlement which might have emerged from German victory, which created a new Europe which was at least politically more just in the Europe of uh, 1914. The cause of the discontent with the settlements of 1919 to 23 rests on the procedures which were used to make these settlements rather than on the terms of the settlements themselves. Above all, these were discontent at the contrast between the procedures which were used and the procedures which pretended to be used, as well as between the high-minded principles which were supposed to be applied and those which really applied. The peoples of the victorious nations had taken to heart their wartime propaganda about the rights of small nations, making the world safe for democracy and putting an end to both power politics and to secret diplomacy. These ideals had been given concrete form in Wilson's 14 points. Whether the feet of powers felt the same enthusiasm for the high ideals is subject to dispute, but these had been promised on November 5, 1918 that the peace settlements would be negotiated and would be based on the 14 points. When it, came, when it became clear that the settlements were to be imposed rather than negotiated, that the 14 points had been lost in the confusion and that the term of, terms of the settlements had been reached by a process of secret negotiations from which uh, small nations had been excluded in which power politics played a much larger role than the safety of democracy, there was a revulsion of feeling against the treaties. <sighs> Uh, in Britain and Germany, propaganda barrages were aimed against these settlements until, by 1929, most of the Western world had feelings of guilt and shame whenever they thought of the Treaty of Versailles. There was a good deal of sincerity in these feelings, especially in England and the United States, but there was also a great deal of insincerity behind them in all countries. In England, the same groups, often the same people who had been in the wartime propaganda and the peace settlements, were loudest in their complaint that the latter had fallen far below the ideals of the former while all the while their real aims uh, were to use power politics to benefit Britain. Certainly there were grounds for criticisms, and equally certainly in the terms of the peace settlements were far from perfect, but criticism should have been directed in a rather than at the hypocrisy and lack of realism in the ideals of the wartime propaganda and at the lack of honesty of the chief negotiators and carrying on the pretense that these ideals were still in effect while they violated them daily and necessarily violated them. The settlements were clearly made by uh, secret negotiations by the great powers exclusively and by power politics. They had to be. No settlements could have been made on any other basis. The failure of the chief negotiators, at least the Anglo-Americans, to admit this is regrettable, but behind their reluctance to admit it is the even more regret regrettable fact that the lack of po political experience and political education of the American and English electorates made it dangerous for the negotiators to admit the facts of life in international political relationships. It is clear that the peace settlements were made by an organization which was chaotic and uh, by a procedure which was fraudulent. None of this was deliberate. It arose rather from the weakness and from ignorance, from a failure to decide before the peace was made who would make it, how it was be to be made, and on what principles it should be based.
The normal way to make peace after a war in which the victors from a coalition would be the victors to hold a conference, agree on the terms they hope to get from the defeated, then have a congress with these uh, latter uh, to impose these terms, either or without discussion and compromise. It was tacitly assumed in October and November 1918 that this method would be used in, to end the existing war. But this Congress, uh, but yeah, but this Congress method uh, could not be used in 1919 for several reasons. The members of the victorious coalition were some were so numerous, uh, 32 Allied and Associated powers, that they could have agreed on terms only slowly and after considerable preliminary organization. This preliminary organization never occurred, largely because President Wilson was too busy to participate in the process, was unwilling to delegate any real authority to others, and with relatively few intensely held ideas, like the League of Nations, democracy, and self-determination, had no taste for the details of organization. Wilson was convinced that if he could only get the League of Nations accepted, any undesirable details in the terms of the treaties could be remedied later through the League. Lord George and Clemenceau uh, made use of this conviction to obtain numerous provisions in the terms which were undesirable to Wilson but highly desirable to them. The time necessary for a preliminary conference or preliminary planning was also lacking. Lord George wanted to carry out the campaign pledge of immediate demobilization and Wilson wanted to go back to his duties as President of the United States. Moreover, if the terms had been drawn up at a preliminary conference, they would have resulted from compromises between the many powers concerned, and these compromises would have broken down as soon as any effort was made to negotiate with the Germans later. Since the Germans had been promised the right to negotiate, it became clear that the terms could not, be, could not first be made the subject of public compromise in a full preliminary conference. Unfortunately, by the time the victorious great powers realized all this and decided to make the terms by secret negotiations among themselves, invitations had already been sent to the, all the victorious powers to come to an inter-allied conference to make preliminary terms. As a solution to the embarrassing situation, peace was made on two levels. On one level, in the full glare of publicity, the inter-allied conference became the plenary peace conference and with considerable fanfare did nothing. On the other level, the great powers worked out their peace terms in secret and when they were ready imposed them simultaneously on the conference and on the Germans. This had not been intended. In fact, it was not clear to anyone just what was being done. As late as February 22nd, Balfour, the British Foreign Secretary, still believed they were working on preliminary peace terms, and, German, and the Germans believed the same on April 15th. While the great powers were negotiating a secret and full conference, uh, in the secret, uh, while the great powers were negotiating in secret, the full conference met several times under rigid rules designed to prevent action. These sessions were governed by the iron hand of Clemenceau, who heard the motions he wanted, jammed through them, those he desired, and answered protests by outright threats to make peace without any consultation with the lesser powers at all, and dark references to the millions of men and great powers the great powers had under arms. On February 14th, the conference was given the draft of the Covenant of the League of Nations and in, on April 11th, the draft of the International Labor, Conference, Labor Office, both were accepted on April 28th. On May 6th came the text of the Treaty of Versailles. Only one day before it was given to the Germans, at the end of May, came the draft of the Treaty of St. Germain with Austria. While this futile show was going on in public, the great powers were making peace in secret. Their meetings were highly informal. When the military leaders were present, the meetings were known as the Supreme War Council. When the military leaders were absent, as they usually were after January 12th, the group was known as the Supreme Council, or the Council of Ten. It consisted of the head of the government and the foreign minister of each of the five great powers, Britain, the United States, France, Italy, Japan. This group met 46 times from January 12th to March 24th, 1919. It worked very ineffectively. At the middle of March, because a sharp dispute over the German-Polish frontier leaked to the press, the Council of Ten was reduced to a Council of Four. Lloyd George, Wilson, Clements Hugh, and Orlando. These four, with Orlando's fre frequently absent, uh, uh, held over 200 meetings in a period of 13 weeks. March 27th to June 28th. 
they put the treaty of Versailles into form in three weeks and did the preliminary work on the treaty with Austria. With Austria, yeah. When the Treaty of Germany was signed on June 28, 1919, the head of the governments left Paris and the Council of Ten ended. So also did the uh, plenary conference. The five foreign ministers, Balfour, Lansing, Pichon, Titany, and Makino, were left in Paris as the Council of Heads of Delegations with full powers to complete the peace settlements. This group finished the treaty with Austria and Bulgaria and had them both signed. They disbanded on January 10, 1920, leaving behind an executive committee, the Conference of Ambassadors. This consisted of the ambassadors of four great powers of Paris, plus a French representative. This group held 200 meetings in the next three years and continued to meet until April, I mean, meet until 1931. It, it, it supervised the execution of the three peace treaties already signed, negotiated the peace treaty with Hungary, and performed many purely political acts which had no treaty basis, such as drawing the Albanian frontier in November 1921. In general, in the decade after the Peace Conference, the Conference of Ambassadors was the organization by which great powers ruled Europe. It acted with power, speed, and secrecy in all issues delegated to it. When issues arose which were too important to be treated in this way, the Supreme Council was occasionally reunited. This was done about 25 times in the three years, 1920-22, to 22, usually in regard to reparations, economic reconstruction, and acute polit political problems. The most important of these meetings of the Supreme Council were held in Paris, London, San Remo, Boulogne, and Spa in 1920, at Paris and London in 1921, and at Paris, Genoa, The Hague, and London in 1922. This valuable practice was ended by Britain in 1923 in protest against the French determination to use force to compel Germany to fulfill the reparation clauses of the peace treaty. At all of these meetings, as the Peace Conference itself, the political leaders were assisted by groups of experts and interested persons, sometimes self-appointed. Many of these experts were members of the Associates of the International Banking Fraternity. At the Paris Peace Conference, the experts numbered thousands and were organized into official staffs by most countries, even before the war ended. These experts were of great importance. They were formed into committees at Paris and give, given problem after problem, especially boundary problems, usually without any indication as to what principle should guide their decisions. The importance of these committees of experts can be seen in the fact that in every case but one where a committee of experts submitted a unanimous report, the Supreme Council accepted its recommendation and incorporated it in, in the treaty. Um, in, in cases where the report was not unanimous, the problem was generally resubmitted to the experts for further consideration. The one case where a unanimous report was not accepted was concerned with the Polish Corridor, the same issue which had forced the Supreme Council to be cut down to the Council of Four in 1919, and the issue which led to the Second World War 20 years later. In this case, the experts were much harsher on Germany than the final decision of the politicians. The treaty with Germany was made by Council of Four assembling the reports of various committees, fitting the parts together, and ironing out various disagreements. The chief disagreements were over the size and nature of German reparations, the nature of German disarmament, the nature of League of Nations, and the territorial settlements in six specific regions, the Polish Corridor, Corridor Upper Silesia, the Saar, Fiume, the Rhineland, and Shantung. When the dispute over Fiume reached a peak, Wilson appealed to the Italian people over the heads of the Italian delegation at Paris, in the belief that the people were less nationalistic and more favorable to his uh, idealistic principles than their rather hard-boiled delegation. This appeal was a failure, but the Italian delegation left the conference and returned to Rome in protest against Wilson's action. Thus, the Italians were absent from Paris at the time that the German and colonial territories were being distributed and, accordingly, did not obtain any colonies. Thus, Italy uh, failed to obtain co compensation in Africa for the French and British gains in territory on that continent, as promised in the Treaty of London in 1915. This disappointment was given by Mussolini as one of the chief justifications for the Italian attack on Ethiopia in 1935. The Treaty of Versailles uh, was uh, presented to the plenary conference on May 6, 1919 in the German delegation the next day. The conference was supposed to accept it without comment, but General Foch, 
commander in chief of the French armies and the Entente forces in the war, made a severe attack on the treaty in regard to its provisions for enforcement. These provisions gave little more than the occupation of the Rhineland in three bridgeheads on the right bank of the Rhine, as already existed under the armistice of November 11, 1918. According to the treaty, these are areas were to be occupied for from 5 to 15 years to enforce a treaty whose substantive provisions required Germany to pay reparations for at least a generation and to remain disarmed forever. Foch insisted that he needed the left bank of the Rhine and the three bridgeheads on the right bank for at least 30 years. Clemenceau, as soon as the meeting was over, rebuked Foch for disrupting the harmony of the assembly. But Foch had put his finger on the weakest yet most vital portion of the treaty. The presentation of the text of the treaty to the Germans the next day was no happier. Having received the document, the chief of the German delegation, Foreign Minister Count Ulrich von Brockdorf Ranzau, made a long speech in which he protested bitterly against the failure to negotiate and the violation of the pre-armistice pre commitments. As a deliberate insult to his listeners, he spoke from a seated position. The German delegation sent the victorious power short, note, short notes of, of detailed criticism during May and exhaustive counter-proposals on May 29th. Running to 443 pages at German text, these counter-proposals criticized the treaty, clause by clause accused the victors of bad faith in violating the 14 points, and offered the victors of bad faith in, uh, sorry, and offered, and offered the, uh, <laughs> accused the victors of bad faith in violating the 14th points, and offered to accept the League of Nations, the disarmament sections, and reparations of 100,000 million marks if the Allies would withdraw any statement that Germany had alone caused the war um, and, and would have readmit Germany to uh, the world's markets. Most of the territorial changes were rejected except where they uh, could be shown to be based on self-determination, thus adopting Wilson's point of view. These proposals led to one of the most severe crises of conference as Lloyd George, who had been re-elected in December on his promise to the British people to squeeze Germany dry and had done his share in this direction from December to May, now began to fear that Germany would refuse to sign in and adopt a passive resistance, which would require the Allies to use force. Since the British armies were being disbanded, such a need of force would fall largely on the French and would be highly welcome to people like Foch who favored duress against Germany. Lloyd George was afraid that any occupation of Germany by French armies would lead to a complete French hegemony on the continent of Europe and that these occupation forces might never be withdrawn, having achieved with British convents what Britain had fought so vigorous, vigorously to prevent at the time of Louis XIV and uh, Napoleon. In other words, the reduction of the German's power as a consequence of this, her defeat was leading Britain back to her old balance of power policies under uh, which Britain imposed its strongest power at the continent, on the continent by building up the strength of the second strongest. At the same time, Lord George was eager to continue the British demobilization in order to satisfy the British people and to reduce the financial burden on Britain so that the country could balance its budget, deflate, and go back on the gold standard. For these reasons, Lord, Lord George suggested that the treaty be weakened by reducing the Rhineland occupation from 15 years to 2, that a uh, plebiscite uh, uh, be held in Upper Silesia, which had been given to Poland, that Germany be admitted to the League of Nations at once, and that the reparations burden be reduced. He obtained only the plebiscite in Upper Silesia in certain other disputed areas. Uh, Wilson rejected the other suggestions in upbraiding the Prime Minister for his sudden change of attitude. Accordingly, the Allied answer to the German counter-proposals, written by Philip Kerr, later Lord Lothian, made only minor modifications in the original terms, chiefly the addition of five plebiscites in the Upper Silesia, Allenstein, Marienwerder, uh, North Schl Schleswig, and the Saar of which the last was to be held in 1935, the others immediately. It also accuses the Germans of the sole guilt in causing the war 
and of uh, inhuman practices during it, and gave them a five-day ultimatum for signing the treaty as it stood. The German delegation at once returned to Germany and recommended a refusal to sign. The cabinet resigned rather than, uh, rather than sign, but a new cabinet was formed of Catholics and Socialists. Both of these groups were fearful that an Allied invasion of Germany would lead to chaos and confusion, which would encourage Bolshevism in the East and separatism in the West. They voted to sign if the articles on war, guilt, and war crimes could be struck from the treaty. When the Allies refused these concessions, the Catholic Century Party voted 64-14 to 14 not to sign. At the critical moment, when the rejection seemed certain, the high command of the German army, through Chief of Staff Wilhelm Groner, ordered the cabinet to sign it in order to prevent a military occupation of Germany. On June 28, 1919, exactly five years after the assassination of Sarajevo in the Hall of the Mirrors at Versailles, where the German Empire had been proclaimed in 1871, the Treaty of Versailles was signed by all delegations except the Chinese. The latter refused in protest against the disposition of the pre-war German concessions in Shangtong. The Austrian treaty was signed by a delegation headed by Karl Renner, but only after the victory had rejected a claim that Austria was a succession state rather than a defeated power and had forced the country to change its name from the newly adopted German Austria to the title Republic of Austria. The new country was forbidden to make any movement toward any union with Germany without the approval of the League of Nations. The Treaty of Neuilly was signed by a single Bulgarian delegate. The Peasants' Party leader, Alexander Stambolyski. By this agreement, Bulgaria lost Western Thrace, her outlet to the Aegean, which had been annexed from Turkey in 1912, as well as certain mountain passes in the west which were ceded from Bulgaria to Yugoslavia for strategic reasons. The Treaty of Trianon, signed in 1920, was the most severe of the peace treaties and the most rigidly enforced. For these and other reasons, Hungary was the most active political force for revision of treaties during the period 1924-34, to and was encouraged in this attitude by Italy from 1927-34. to and hoped that there might be profitable fishing in such troubled waters. Hungary had good reason to be discontented. The fall of the Habsburg dynasty in 1918 and the uprisings of the subject peoples of Hungary, like the Poles, Slovaks, Romanians, and Croatians, brought to power in Budapest a liberal government under Count Michael Karoli. This government was at once threatened by a Bolshevik uprising under Bela Kun. In order to protect itself, the Karoli government asked for an Allied occupation force until after the election scheduled for April 1919. This request was refused by General Franchet de Isperé under the influence of a reactionary Hungarian politician, Count Stefan Bethlen. The Karoli regime fell before the attacks of Belakun and the Romanians in consequence of a lack of support from the West. After Belakun's reign of bread terrorism, which lasted six months, marched through August 1920 and his flight before a Romanian invasion of Hungary, the reactionaries came to power with Admiral Miklos Horthy as regent and head of state 1920-44 and Count Bethlen as prime minister 1921-1931. Count Caroli, who was pro-allied, anti-German, pacifist, democratic, and liberal, realized that no progress was possible in Hungary without some solution of agrarian question and the peasant discontent arising from the monopolization of the land. Because of the Allies' refusal to support this program, Hungary fell into the hands of Horthy and Bethlen, who were anti-allied, pro-German, under undemocratic, militaristic, and unprogressive. This group was persuaded to sign the Treaty of Trianon by a trick and ever afterward repudiated it. Maurice uh, Paleologue, uh, Secretary General of the French Ministry, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but acting on behalf of France's great industrialist, Eugene Sch Schneider, made a deal with the Hungarians that if they would sign the Treaty of Trianon as it stood and give Schneider control of the Hungarian state railways, the Port of Budapest, and the Hungarian uh, General Credit Bank, which had a stranglehold on, 
Hungarian industry, France would eventually make Hungary one of the mainstays of its anti-German bloc in the Eastern Europe, would sign a military convention with Hungary, and would, at the proper time, obtain a drastic revision of the Treaty of Trianon. The Hungarian side of this complex deal was largely carried out, but British and Italian ob objections to the extension of French economic control in into Central Europe disrupted the negotiations and prevented Hungary from obtaining its reward. Peleologue, uh, although forced to resign and replaced at the Quai d'Orsay by the anti-Hungarian and pro-Czech uh, Philippe Berthelot, received his reward from Schneider. He was made a director of Schneider's personal holding company for his Central European interests, the Union European Industrial et Financier. The Treaty of Severus, was, uh, uh, Severus with Turkey was the last one made, and the only one never ratified. There were three reasons for the delay. One, the uncertainty about the role of the United States, which was expected to accept control of the Straits and mandate for Armenia, thus forming a buffer against Soviet Russia. Two, the instability of the Turkish government, which was treated which was threatened by a nationalist uprising led to led by Mustafa Kemal and three the scandal caused by the Bolshevik publication of the secret treaties regarding the Ottoman Empire since these treaties contrasted so sharply with the expressed war aims of the Allies. The news that the United States refused to participate in the Near East settlement made it possible to draw up a treaty. This was begun by the Supreme Council at its London conference on February 20th, 1920, excuse me, and continued at San Remo in, in April. It was signed by the Sultan's governor, government on, on August 20th, 1920, but the nationalists under Mustafa Kemal refused to accept it and set up an insurgent government at Ankara. The Greeks and Italians, with Allied support, invaded Turkey and attempted to force the treaty on the nationalists. But they were much weakened by the ascension uh, behind the facade of Entente Solidarity. The French believed that greater economic concessions would be obtained from the Kemalist government, while the British felt that richer prospects were to be obtained from the Sultan. In particular, the French were prepared to support the claims of Standard Oil to such concessions, while the British were prepared to support Royal Dutch Shell. The Nationalist forces made good use of these dis dissensions. After buying off the Italians and French with economic concessions, they launched a counteroffensive against the Greeks. Although, the England, although England came to the rescue of the Greeks, it received no support from the other powers, while the Turks had the support of Soviet Russia. The Turks destroyed the Greeks, burned Smyrna, and came face to face with the British at Chinook. At this critical moment, the Dominions, in answer to Curzon's telegraphed appeal, refused to support a war with Turkey. The Treaty of Severus, already in tatters, had to be discarded. A new conference at Lausanne in November 1922 produced a moderate and negotiate, negotiated treaty which was signed by the Kemalist government on July 24, 1923. This act ended, in a formal way, the First World War. It also took a most vital step toward establishing a new Turkey which would serve as powerful force for peace and stability in the Near East. The decline of Turkey, which had continued for 400 years, was finally ended. By this treaty of Lusain, Turkey gave up all non-Turkish territory except Kurdistan, losing Arabia, Mesopotamia, the Levant, Western Thrace, and some islands of the Aegean. The, cap the, capitu the capitulations were abolished in return for a promise of judicial reform. There were no reparations and no disarmament, except that the straits were demilitarized and were to be used to all ships except those of belligerents if Turkey was at war. Turkey accepted a mi minorities treaty and agreed to a compulsory exchange with Greece of Greek and Turkish minorities, judged on the basis of membership in Greek Orthodox or Muslim religions. Under this last provision, over 1,250,000 Greeks were removed from Turkey by 1930. Unfortunately, most of these had been urban shopkeepers in Turkey and, and were settled as farmers on, on the unhospitable soil of Macedonia. The Bulgarian peasants who had previously lived in Macedonia were unceremoniously dumped into Bulgaria where they were tinder for the sparks of a revolution 
revolutionary Bulgarian secret society called the Internal Macedonian Revolutionary Organization, IMRO, whose chief method of political action was assassination. As a result of the rising tide of aggression in the 1930s, the clause regarding the demilitarization of the Straits was revoked at the uh, Montreux, Montreux Convention of July 1936. This gave Turkey full sovereignty of the Straits, including the right to fortify them. All the original peace treaties consisted of five chief parts. A. The Covenant of the League of Nations. B. Territorial Provisions. C. Disarmament Provision. D. Reparation Provisions. E. Penalties and Guarantees. The first of these must be reserved until later, but the others should be mentioned here. In theory, the territorial provisions of the treaties were based on self-determination, but in fact they were usually based on other considerations. Strategic, economic, punitive, legal, power, or compensation. By self-determination, the peacekeepers usually meant nationality, and by nationality they usually meant language except in the Ottoman Empire, where nationality usually meant religion. The six cases were self-determination, that is, plebiscites. What was actually used, to sh uh, used showed that the peoples of these areas were not so nationalistic as the pe peacemakers believed. Because in Allenstein, where Polish-speaking people were 40% of the population, only 2% voted to join Poland. The area was returned to Germany. In our in Upper Silesia, where the comparable figures were 65% and 40%, the area was split. A more industrial eastern portion going to Poland, while the more rural western part was returned to Germany. In Klagenfurt, where Slovene speakers formed 68% of the population, only 40% wanted to join Yugoslavia. So the area was left in Austria. Somewhat similar results occurred in the Marian where there but not in the northern Schleswig, uh, which voted to join Denmark. In each case, the voters probably, for economic reasons, chose to join the economically more prosperous state rather than the one sharing the same language. In addition to the areas mentioned, Germany had to return all states in Lorraine to France, give three small districts to Belgium, and abandon the northern edge of East Prussia around Memel to the Allied powers. This last area was given to the new state of Lithuania in 1924 by the Conference of Ambassadors. The chief territorial disputes arose over the Polish corridor, the Rhineland, and the Saar, the 14 points it promised to establish an independent Poland with access to the Baltic Sea. It had been French policy since about 1500 to oppose any strong state in Central Europe by seeking allies in Eastern Europe. With the collapse of Russia in 1917, the French sought a substitute ally in Poland. Accordingly, uh, Foch wanted to give all of East Prussia to Poland. Instead, the experts, who were very pro-Polish, gave Poland access to the sea by severing East Prussia from the rest of Germany by creating a Polish corridor in the valley of the Vistula. Most of the area was Polish-speaking in German commerce with East Prussia was largely by sea. However, the city of Danzig, at the mouth of the Vistula, was clearly a German city. Lloyd George refused to give it to Poland. Instead, it was made a free city under the protection of the League of Nations. The French wished to detach the whole of Germany west of the Rhine, in so-called Rhineland, to create a separate state and increase French security against Germany. They gave up their separatist agitation in return for Wilson's promise of March 14, 1919, to give a joint Anglo-American guarantee against the German attack. This promise was signed in a treaty form on June 28, 1919, but fell through when the United States Senate did not ratify the agreement. Since Clemenceau had been able to persuade Foch and Poincare to accept a Rhine settlement only because of this guarantee, its failure to materialize ended his political career. The Rhineland settlement, as it stood, had two quite separate provisions. On the one hand, the Rhineland and three bridgeheads on the right bank of the Rhine were to be occupied by Allied troops for 5 to 15 years. On the other hand, the Rhineland in the zone 50 km kilometers uh, wide along the right bank were to be uh, permanently demilita demilitarized 
and any violation of this could be regarded as hostile, a hostile act by the signers of the treaty. This meant that any German troops or fortifications were excluded from this area forever. This was the most important clause of the Treaty of Versailles. So long as it remained in effect, the great industrial region of the Ruhr on the right bank of the Rhine, the economic backbone of Germany's ability to wage warfare, was exposed to a quick French military thrust from the west, and Germany could not threaten France or move eastward against Czechoslovakia or Poland if France objected. Of these two clauses, the military occupation of Rhineland and the bridgeheads uh, was ended in 1930, five years ahead of the schedule. This made it possible for Hitler to destroy the second provision, the demilitarization of western Germany, by remilitarizing re the area in March 1936. The last disputed territorial change at the Treaty of Versailles was concerned with the Saar Basin, rich in industri industry and coal. Although its population was clearly German, the French claimed most of it in 1919 on the grounds that two-thirds of it had been inside the French frontiers of 1814, and that they should obtain the coal mines as compensation for the French mines destroyed by the Germans in 1918. They didn't get the mines, but the area was separated politically from both countries to be ruled by the League of Nations for 15 years and then given a plebiscite. When the plebiscite was held in 1935, after an admirable Admiral, boy, yeah, a league administration. Only about 2,000 out of about 528,000 voted to join France, while about 90% wished to join Germany, the remainder indicating their desire to continue under league rule. The Germans, as a result of this vote, agreed to buy back the coal mines from France for 900 million francs payable in coal over a five year period. The territorial provisions of the Treaty of St. Germain and Trianon were such as to destroy completely the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Austria was reduced from 115,000 square miles with 30 million inhabitants to 32,000 square miles with 6.5 million inhabitants. The Sh uh, Czechoslovakia went Bohemia, Moravia, parts of Lower Austria, and Austrian Silesia. To Yugoslavia went Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Dalmatia. To Romania went Bukovina. To Italy went South Tyrol, Trentino, Ist Istria, and an extensive area north of the Adriatic, including Trieste. The Treaty of Trianon reduced Hungary from 125,000 square miles with 21 million inhabitants to 35,000 square miles with 8 million inhabitants. To Czechoslovakia went Slovakia and Ruthenia. The Romania went Transylvania, part of the Hungarian plain, and most of the Banat. The Yugoslavia went to the rest of the Banat, Croatia, Slavonia, and some other districts. The Treaty of Peace set the boundaries of the defeated states, but not those of the new states. These latter were fixed by a number of treaties made in the years following 1918. The process led to disputes and even to violent clashes of arms and some issues are still subjects of discord to the present time. The most violent controversies arose in regard to the boundaries of Poland. Of these, only that with Germany was set by the Treaty of Versailles. The Poles refused to accept their other frontiers as suggested by the Allies at Paris, and by 1920 were at war with Lithuania over Vilna, with Russia over the eastern border, with the Ukrainians over Galicia, and with Czechoslovakia over Teshtyn. The struggle over Vilna began in 1919 when the Poles took the district from the Russians, but soon lost it again. The Russians yielded it to the Lithuanians in 1920, and this was accepted by Poland, but within three months it was seized by Polish freebooters. A plebiscite, ordered by the League of Nations, was held in January 20, 1922 under Polish control and gave a Polish man majority. The Lithuanians refused to accept the valid validity of this vote or a decision of the Conference of Ambassadors of March 1923, giving the area to Poland. Instead, Lithuania continued to consider itself at war with Poland until December 1927. Poland did not fare so well at the other end of its frontier. Their, mighty, their fighting broke out between uh, <coughs> Czech and Polish for forces over Teshin in January 1919. The Conference of Ambassadors divided the area between the two claimants, but gave the valuable coal mines to Czechoslovakia, July 1920. Poland's eastern frontier was settled only after a bloody war with the Soviet Union. 
the Supreme Council of December 1919 had laid down the so-called Curzon Line as the eastern boundary of Polish administration. But within six months, the Polish armies had crossed this and advanced beyond Kiev. The Russian counterattack soon drove the Poles back. The Polish territory was invaded in its turn. The Poles appealed in panic to the Supreme Council, which was reluctant to intervene. The French, however, did not hesitate and sent General Weigand with his supplies to defend Warsaw. The Russian offensive was broken on the Vistula, and peace negotiations began. The final settlement signed at Riga in March 1921 gave Poland a frontier 150 miles farther east than the Curzon Line and brought into Poland many non-Polish peoples, including 1 million white Russians and 4 million Ukrainians. Romania also had a dispute with Russia arising from the Romanian occupation of Bessarabia in 1918. In October 1920, the Conference of Ambassadors recognized Bessarabia as part of Romania. Russia pro protested, and the United States refused to accept the transfer. In view of these disturbances, uh, Poland and Romania signed a defensive alliance against Russia in March 1921. The most important dispute of this kind arose over the disposition of Fiume. This problem was acute, acute because one of the great powers was involved. The Italians had yielded Fiume to Yugoslavia in the Treaty of London of 1915 and had promised in November 1918 to draw the Italian-Yugoslav boundary on lines of nationality. Thus, they had little claim to Fiume. Nevertheless, at Paris, they insisted on it for political and economic reasons. Having just excluded the Habsburg Empire from the Adriatic Sea and not wishing to see any new power rise in its place, they did all they could to hamper Yugoslavia and to curtail its access to the Adriatic. Moreover, the Italian acquisition of Trieste gave them a great seaport with no future, since it was separated by a political boundary from the hinterland whence it could draw its trade. To protect Trieste, Italy wanted to control all the possible competing ports in the area. The city of Fiume itself was largely Italian, but the suburbs and surrounding countryside were overwhelmingly Slav. The experts at Paris wished to give Italy neither Fiume nor Dalmatia, but Colonel House tried to overrule the experts in order to obtain Italian support for the League of Nations in return. Wilson's over, Wilson overruled House and issued his... Uh, and, and Wilson overruled House and issued his famous appeal to the Italian people, which resulted in the temporary withdrawal of the Italian delegation from Paris. After the return, the issue was left unsettled. In September 1919, an erratic Italian poet, Gabriel de Annunzio, with a band of freebooters, seized Fiume and set up an independent government on a comic opera basis. The dispute between Italy and uh, Yugoslavia continued with decreasing bitterness until November 1920, when they signed the Treaty of Rapallo, dividing the area but leaving Fiume itself a free city. This settlement was not satisfactory. A group of fascists from Italy, where this party was not yet in office, seized the city in March 1922 and were removed by Italian army three weeks later. The problem was finally settled by the Treaty of Rome of January 1924, by which Fiume was granted to Italy, but the suburb of Port Barros and 50-year lease on one of the three harbor basins went to Yugoslavia. These territorial disputes are of importance because they continued to lacerate relationships between neighboring states until well into the period of World War II and even later. The names of Fiume, Thrace, Bessarabia, Epirus, Transylvania, Memel, Vilna, Teschen, and Saar, Danzig, and Macedonia were still echoing as battle cries of overheated nationalists 20 years after the peace conference assembled at Paris. The work of that conference has undoubtedly reduced the numbers of minority peoples, but this had only served to increase the intensity of feeling of the minorities remaining. The number of these remained large. There were, over a, there were over a million Germans in Poland, 550,000 in Hungary, 3 million and 100,000 in Czechoslovakia, about 700,000 in Romania, 500,000 in Yugoslavia, and 250,000 in Italy. There were 450,000 Magyars in Yugoslavia, 750,000 in Czechoslovakia, and about 1,500,000 in Romania. There were about 5 million white Russians and Ukrainians in Poland and about 1,100,000 of these in Romania.
To protect these minorities, the Allied and Associated Powers forced the new states of Central and Eastern Europe to sign minority treaties, by which these minorities were granted a certain minimum of cultural and political rights. These treaties were guaranteed by the League of Nations, but there was no power to enforce observation of their terms. The most that could be done was to issue a public repr reprimand against the offending government, as was done more than once, for example, against Poland. The disarmament provisions of the peace treaties were much easier to draw up than, be, than to enforce. It was cl clearly understood that the disarmament of the defeated powers was but the first step toward the general disarmament of the victors' nations as well. In the case of the Germans, this connection was explicitly made in the treaty so that it was necessary in order to keep Germans illegally disarmed for the other signers of the treaty to work constantly toward general disarmament after 1919, lest the Germans claim that they were no longer bound to remain disarmed. In all of the treaties, certain weapons like tanks, poisonous gas, airplanes, heavy artillery, and warships over a certain size, as well as all international trade and arms, were forbidden. Germany was allowed a small navy fixed in number and size of vessels, while Austria, Hungary, and Bulgaria were allowed no navy worthy of the name. Each army was restricted in size, Germany to 100,000, Austria to 30,000, Hungary to 35,000, and Bulgaria to 20,000. Moreover, these men had to be volunteers on 12-year enlistments, and all compulsory military training, general staffs, or mobilization plans were forbidden. These training provisions were a mistake, forced through by the Anglo-Americans over the vigorous protests of the French. The Anglo-Americans regarded the compulsory military training as militaristic. The French considered it the natural concomitant of universal manhood suffrage and had no objections to its use in Germany, since it would provide only a large number of poorly trained men. They did, however, object to the 12-year enlistment favored by the British, since this would provide Germany with a large number of highly trained men who could be used as officers in any revived German army. On this, as in so many issues where the French were overruled by the Anglo-Americans, time was to prove that the French position was correct. The reparations provisions of the treaties caused some of the most violent arguments at the peace conference and were a prolific source of controversy for more than a dozen years after the conference ended. The, the efforts of the Americans to establish some rational basis for reparations, either by an engineering survey of the actual damage to be repaired, or an economic survey of Germany's capacity to pay reparations, were shunted aside, largely because of French objections. At the same time, American efforts to restrict reparations to war damages and not allow them to be extended to cover the much larger total of war costs were blocked by the British who would have obtained much less under damage, damages than under costs. By providing to the French that the German capacity to pay was, in fact, limited, and that French would get a, a much larger fraction of Germany's payments under the damages than under costs, the Americans were able to cut down on the British demands. Although the South African delegate, General Smuts, was able to get military pensions inserted as one of the categories for which Germany had to pay. The French were, were torn between a desire to obtain as large a fraction as possible of Germany's payments and a desire to pile on Germany such as a crushing burden of indebtedness that Germany would be ruined beyond the point where it could threaten French security again. The British delegation was sharply divided. The chief British financial delegates, Lord Cunliffe and Sumner, were so astronomically unrealistic in their estimates of Germany's ability to pay that they were called the Heavenly Twins, while many younger members of the delegation led by John Maynard, later Lord uh, Keynes, Keynes, sorry, uh, either saw important economic limits on Germany's ability to pay or felt that a policy of fellowship and fraternity should incline Britain towards a low estimate of Germany's obligations. Feeling was so high on the issue that it uh, proved impossible to set an exact figure for Germany's reparations in the treaty itself. Instead, a compromise, originally suggested by American John Foster Dulles, was adopted. By this, Germany was forced to admit an unlimited theoretical obligation to pay, but was actually bound to pay for only a limited list of ten categories of obligations. The foreign admission has gone down in history as the War Guilt Clause, Article 231 of the treaty, but in Germany, accepted 
the responsibility of Germany and her allies for causing all the loss and damage to which the Allied Associated Governments and their nationals have been subjected as a consequence of the war imposed upon them by the ag aggression of Germany and her allies. The following clause, Article 232, was considered with the reparations obligation listing ten categories of damages of which the tenth, concerned with the pensions and inserted by General Smuts, represented a liability larger than the aggregate of the preceding nine categories together. Since a considerable a period was needed for the Reparations Commission to discover the value of these categories, the Germans were required to begin immediate delivery to the victors of the large quantities of property, chiefly coal and timber. Only in May 1921 was the full reparations of obligation presented to the Germans, amounting to 132,000 million gold marks, about 30, $32.5 billion. This bill was accepted by Germany under pressure of a six-day ultimatum, which threatened to occupy the Ruhr Valley. The reparations clauses of the other treaties were of little significance. Austria was un unable to pay any reparations because of the weakened economic condition of their stump of the Habsburg Empire. Bul Bulgaria and Hungary paid only small fractions of their obligations before all the reparations were wiped out on the financial debacle of 1931-32. to the treaties made at Paris had no enforcement provisions worthy of the name except for the high inadequate, highly inadequate Rhineland clauses, which we have already mentioned. It is quite clear that the defeated powers could be made to fulfill the provisions of these treaties only if the coalition, which had won the war, were to continue to work as a unit. This did not occur. The United States was left... Uh, the United States left the coalition as a result of the Republican victory over Wilson in the congressional elections of 1918 and the presidential election in 1920. Italy was alienated by the failure of the treaty to satisfy her ambitions in the Mediterranean and Africa. But these were only details. If the Anglo-French Entente had been maintained, the treaties could have been enforced without either the United States or Italy. It was not maintained. Britain and France saw the world from a points of view so different that it was almost impossible to believe that they were looking at the same world. The reason for this was simple, although it may it had many complex consequences and implications. Britain, after 1918, uh, felt secure, while France felt completely insecure in the face of Germany. As a consequence of the war, even before the Treaty of Versailles was signed, uh, Britain had obtained all her chief ambitions in respect to Germany. The German Navy was at the bottom of the scapa flow, scuttled by the Germans themselves. The German merchant fleet was scattered, captured, and destroyed. The German colonial rivalry was ended and its areas occupied. The German commercial rivalry was crippled by the loss of its uh, patents and industrial techniques. The destruction of all its commercial outlets and banking connections throughout the world, and the loss of its rapidly growing pre-war markets. Britain had obtained these aims by December 1918 and needed no treaty to retain them. France, on the other hand, uh, had not obtained the one thing it wanted, security. In population and industrial strength, uh, Germany was far stronger than France and still growing. It was evident that, that France had been able to defeat Germany only by a narrow margin in 1914-18 and only because of the help of Britain, Russia, Italy, Belgium, and the United States. Uh, uh, France had no guarantee that all these, or even any of them, would be at, at its side in any future war with Germany. In fact, it was cl quite clear that Russia and Italy would not be at its side. This, the, the refusal of the United States and Britain to give any guarantee to France against German aggression made it dubious that they would be ready to help it, uh, either. Even if they were prepared to come to the rescue ultimately, there was no guarantee that France would be able to withstand the initial German assault in any future war if she had withstood by the barest margin, the assault of 1914.
even if it could be withstood and Britain ultimately came to the rescue, France would, France would have to fight. Once again, as in the period 1914-18, with the richest portion of France under enemy military occupation. In such circumstances, what guarantee would there be even if the ult ultimate success? Doubts of this kind gave France a feeling of insecurity which practically became a psychosis, especially as France found its efforts to increase its security blocked at every turn by Britain. It seemed to France that the Treaty of Versailles, which had given Britain everything it, want, it could want from Germany, did not give France the one thing it wanted. As a result, it, it proved impossible to obtain any solution to the other uh, chief problems of international politics in the period 1919-29. Of these three problems of security, disarmament, and reparations, uh, we, now we now turn.